In this presentation we will introduce the basic concepts in dynamics and discuss Newton's three laws of motion. The content of this presentation is the following. We will start with a historical introduction to dynamics providing an orientation to the concepts and the laws of nature related to motion. Then we will present Newton's first law of motion, illustrated with several examples. These examples also help us to introduce a special frame of reference, called inertial frame, in which the laws of motion are valid. The second law of motion is formulated by applying examples with bodies changing their state of motion due to their interaction. These examples show that the change in the state of motion of a body, that is its acceleration is always an effect of other bodies, and we call this effect force. Besides force we will introduce the concepts of inertia and mass as well, which belong to the fundamental properties of any object in nature. We describe different methods to measure force and mass applying the laws of motion. We will talk about both the static and dynamic methods of force and mass measurement. Then we introduce the SI unit of mass and present its properties together with the law of the conservation of mass. We also discuss the equivalence of inertial mass and gravitational mass. We start the presentation of Newton's third law of motion with some basic examples, focusing on the fact that interactions are mutual between bodies. The analysis of these examples leads us to formulate the third law about action and reaction, which helps us to explain some problems in statics with bodies at rest. We finish this presentation with the fourth law of motion, which is also related to the nature of the effects between bodies or forces acting on bodies. The fourth law allows us to represent forces with vectors and provide a quantitative description of the effects between bodies. Based on this law, we will able to formulate the principle of superposition of forces which is indispensable in the study of the interaction in a system of bodies. Let us start with a brief introduction on the history of those ideas and concepts which shape the development of dynamics. The word dynamic was introduced from French dynamique by Gottfried Leibniz in 1691. The French word was originated from the Greek word dynamis, which appeared in the Aristotle in physics and means power or force. Thus dynamics can be translated as the study of forces. In the historical introduction to kinematics, we already mentioned that the Greek atomists, with their two founders Leucippus and Democritus were the first thinkers who provided a more quantitative picture on motion and change in nature. In their view, the cosmos has two basic constituents, the atoms and the void, where atoms have shape and size and they are in constant motion. They claim that these atoms fall through the void with the same speed because of their own weight, that is the cause of their motion is an effect dragging them downward. However, they consider this effect, or the weight of an atom, as its inherent property which does not emerge from the interaction between atoms and earth. This is not completely true. Although mass is a fundamental property of bodies in nature, the weight of bodies is interpreted as the effect of Earth's gravity on bodies. The atomists had no clear concept about the gravitational force, but they already applied some physical concepts to describe the cause of motion in nature. Aristotle considered the investigation of the causal effect central to the theoretical study of motion. We already saw that he applied physical principles to describe the motion in the sublunary sphere. Aristotle claimed that when bodies have natural motion, they rise or fall to their natural positions with a speed proportional to their weight. Heavy objects fall faster than light ones, for the impelling force is greater for a heavier object. If bodies move some other direction, they have unnatural motion due to external effects. The concept of effects changing the state of motion of bodies is already clear here, however Aristotle could not separate correctly which bodies are free from external effects and which ones are under the influence of them. He believed that a constant force must be applied on a body so that it could maintain a linear uniform motion. For this constant force or never diminishing impetus, a medium, such as air was essential so that this force could be mediated to the moving object. At the same time, he considered not only free fall but also the state of rest as the natural state of bodies, in which they are free from any external effects. In fact, the opposite is true. Nevertheless, it is difficult to recognize the force-free states of bodies when we study their motion under the influence of Earth's gravity, or give the correct interpretation of the effect of the air resistance on the motion of bodies in Earth's atmosphere. Although Galileo maintained the Aristotelian classification of motion with the categories of natural motion and unnatural or violent motion as he called it, he used them to refute the impetus theory of scholasticism and it helped him to anticipate the law of inertia. Perhaps Galileo's greatest contribution to dynamics was his formulation of the concept of inertia. He claimed that an object in a state of motion possesses an inertia, that causes it to remain in that state of motion unless an external force acts on it. Galileo also recognized the role of air resistance in motion, 
and he considered the effect of the medium as a perturbation of the motion determined by the mathematical law that the body would follow in its absence. He realized that the uniform linear motion is the most natural way of motion, where bodies move without any external effects. Therefore, he started to clarify the role of the forces in motion and performed many experiments to study the mathematical laws of motion. In his experiments he could demonstrate the universality of freefall, stating that the effect of gravitational force is the same on any object falling towards the Earth. The evolution of the ideas related to dynamics took a leap forward in the Renaissance. Leonardo da Vinci, the great Italian artist and polymath, and Simon Stevin, a Flemish mathematician, physicist and engineer examined many different kinds of problems in statics. We have already seen that statics is a special case of dynamics, in which we study bodies in the state of rest, and determine the criteria for their balance. It was already evident for both Leonardo and Stevin, that bodies are at rest due to the effects of other bodies. These effects were regarded as forces acting on the bodies at rest. By examining various bodies at rest and the forces acting on them, they formulated a principle stating that two forces acting at a given point of a body can be replaced by an equivalent force constructed by the parallelogram law. This principle is crucial for the interpretation of force as a vector, which can be decomposed and added to another vector. As a result, the effects on bodies by other bodies can be represented as a set of vectors, which have magnitudes and directions. Isaac Newton, who formulated the three laws of motion also determined the role of forces in dynamics. In his first law of motion he claimed that the state of motion of bodies can only be changed by an effect of other bodies, and he called this effect force. In the second law, he stated that there is a quantitative relation between the effect, that is the force and the rate of the change in the state of motion of the body due to the force acting on the body. In the third law of motion, he also assumed that the effects changing the state of motion of bodies are mutual interactions, that is both bodies have opposite effects on each other in their interaction. As a consequence of the laws of motion, two fundamental properties of bodies were introduced based on the concepts in statics and dynamics. In the case of bodies at rest we can talk about the gravitational mass of bodies, which we associate with the heaviness of bodies and can determine in static measurements. However, bodies have also inertial mass, which can be interpreted as their resistance to the effects changing their state of motion, and determined in dynamic measurements. These two types of masses have nothing to do with each other, but the universality of free fall demonstrates the equivalence principle stating that the gravitational mass and inertial masses are equivalent. Hautefouche Laurent was the first physicist who performed an experiment with a torsion balance to test the equivalence of gravitational and inertial mass with extreme accuracy. Since the first experiment several other tests had been carried out, and were able to confirm the equivalence principle with better and better precision. In order to discuss Newton's laws of motion, we need to introduce the concept of dynamics. When we study the motion of a body in kinematics, we have no concern about the effects of other bodies on its motion. We also neglect any physical property of the traveling body, which can be relevant to its motion. It is not the case in dynamics, where we examine the effects of other bodies on the motion of the body under study, and we also take into account those properties of the body which could be relevant to its motion. In our everyday activity we can determine which objects are in some way related to the motion of a given body. For example, if we throw a ball, then our hand is the body moving the ball which is related to its motion. If the ball is already flying in the air, then the earth and the air itself have some effects on the motion of the ball. Without the effects of these bodies, the motion of the ball was different. In some cases we can eliminate or ignore the effect of other bodies. When we study a free-falling heavy body we can neglect the air resistance, or we can eliminate the effect of the earth for bodies moving on horizontal flat surfaces, such as a table or the floor. In the experiments with bodies moving on flat horizontal surfaces we always observe the same result. If a ball is pushed on the floor or hockey disc is hit on the ice, then it attains a given speed and moves along a straight line on the given surface. We can also observe that the smoother the surface is on which the body moves, the longer the distance it can cover during its motion. Therefore, the smoother the surface is on which the body moves, the smaller the rate of the decrease in its speed is during the motion. We can conclude that the friction between the body and the surface has an effect on the motion of the body, opposing its motion. As a result, the moving body slows down while traveling along a straight line. We can also assume if we could eliminate the friction, then the body kept its initial speed. We can draw the same conclusion if we study the motion of a horizontally launched projectile. Here we can see a cannon shooting a projectile in the horizontal direction. The projectile moves along a parabola, 
which we explain by the composition of uniform linear motion and free fall. That is, the projectile moved along a horizontal line determined by the direction and the magnitude of the initial velocity gained at the launch. However, there is a contribution of free fall, which is the effect of the Earth's presence on the motion of the projectile. As a result, the vector sum of the initial velocity and the velocity gained from free fall gives the instantaneous velocity of the projectile, which is the tangent to the parabolic trajectory of the moving body. We can assume if we could switch off the effect of Earth's presence, then the projectile had only the initial velocity in the horizontal direction and moved along a straight line. In fact, this condition holds in the space far from any star or planet. Based on these findings we can state the following axiom, which is called Newton's first law of motion. Every body continues in its state of rest or of uniform motion in a straight line, unless it is compelled to change that state of motion by the effects of other bodies impressed upon it. According to the first law of motion, if a ball is rolling on the floor and the effect due to the friction is negligible, then it travels along a straight line at a constant speed. If the ball collides elastically with another ball, then the later one has an effect on its motion. As a result, the moving ball changes the direction of its motion. At the same time, the moving ball resists the effect attempting to change the state of its motion. We attribute this behavior to a property of bodies, called inertia. Inertia of bodies expresses the fact that they remain in the same state of motion without any external effect, and resist any effect attempting to change this state. There are numerous examples for the manifestation of inertia. We can demonstrate the inertia of the glass of water put on a sheet of paper. If the sheet is pulled quickly then the glass will not move. Inertia keeps the glass of water in place because friction between the paper and the glass is not enough to cause the sheet to pull the glass of water with it. Inertia also affects passengers in a car because they are in motion with the vehicle. If a car comes to a sudden stop, the passenger's body tends to keep moving forward until stopped by the seat belt. When the car starts moving again the passenger's body tends to stay in rest and is pushed against the seat. Let us see what the consequences of the first law of motion are. The uniform motion along a straight line or the rectilinear uniform motion is the simplest form of motion, not only in kinematics, but also in dynamics. This is the form of the motion, where the velocity of the body is constant, which does not need external effects due to other bodies to maintain itself. The state of rest can be considered as a special case, where the speed of the body is zero. The view that the state of rest is the most natural state of the object in nature, as opposed to the uniform linear motion, prevailed science from Aristotelian physics till Galileo's era. This demonstrates that Newton's first law is not an obvious statement. We also have to keep in mind, that the first law of motion is the extrapolation of countless results of experiments observed in nature to the ideal limiting case, where a body is completely free from effects of other objects. This statement is an axiom, that is the first law cannot be proven with direct experiments, since no material object can be withdrawn from the effects of other bodies. If a body has a uniform linear motion or it is at rest, it does not necessarily mean that other bodies do not have effect on it, but different effects could produce a zero net effect by cancelling each other. Here we can see a ball rolling with a constant speed on the floor. The effect of the earth on the ball is compensated by the effect of the floor. As a result, the ball is not free falling but rolling on the floor, and it keeps its initial velocity provided the friction between the ball and the floor is negligible. As seen before, the state of rest can be considered as a special case of the linear uniform motion, where the speed is zero. In our everyday environment the majority of the object are in rest, as in the figure showing some books placed on the table. Here the effect of the earth on the books and the effect of the table cancel out each other and the books remain in the state of rest. We have seen that Newton's first law of motion describes the motion with respect to a frame of reference. However, the first law of motion does not tell us what frame of reference is used to describe the state of rest or the motion of a given body. It is an important question, since the description of the motion can be completely different with respect to different frames of reference. For example, a body can be in the state of rest with respect to the earth, but it has an accelerating motion with respect to a train traveling on a round track. In Newton's view, the motion can always be described in an absolute space, which is similar and movable, and without relation to any external body or object. His view was proved to be incorrect in the light of modern physics. Nevertheless, in classical mechanics we can assume that there exists a frame of reference, called inertial frame, in which the first law of motion together with other laws of mechanics are valid. We consider a coordinate system fixed to the lab frame or the earth such an inertial frame, at least approximately. 
In order to discuss Newton's second law of motion, we need to introduce the concept of force in dynamics. According to the first law, the acceleration of a body is a manifestation of some effect of other bodies. If the velocity of a body is changing, that is if the body is accelerating, it is always the consequence of an effect of other bodies on the moving body. In this example, the moving ball A collides with the ball B. As the result of the collision, the ball A changes its speed in the direction of its motion, that is the ball B had an effect on the motion of the ball A. In the description of the collision, the moving bodies are approximated with the point masses A and B, and their velocities are measured in an inertial frame. If a body has such an effect on another body, that changes its velocity, then we call this effect a force acting on the accelerating body. Then force is a physical quantity, measuring the effect of bodies on a given body, which changes its state of the motion. The change in its state of the motion means the change of the velocity of the body, that is the change in its speed or the direction of its motion. Let us consider a moving body. If other bodies has an effect on this body which accelerates its motion, then instead of this effect, we talk about a force acting on the body which accelerates it. That is, we represent the concept of the effect between bodies with a physical quantity, namely the force exerted by and acting on bodies. The concept of force is historically connected to the force exerted by muscles, since it is the most obvious type of force which is able to accelerate bodies. In dynamics force gained a general meaning, since arbitrary objects or physical processes can produce effects causing acceleration in the motion of a body. It is important to understand this generalization of the concept of force, since we can find forces of different nature in the everyday life. We have already mentioned mechanical force. A typical example for application of mechanical force is the traveling carriage drawn by horses. Beside mechanical force, we present examples for other types of force. The freely falling or thrown bodies are subjected to the gravity of the earth, and their acceleration is due to gravitational force. Suspension springs applied in vehicles can compensate uneven road surfaces, since the elastic force exerted by them is able to absorb shocks. The decrease in the velocity of a body thrust on a plane surface, or the fact that a matchstick can lit by rubbing it against the rough side of a matchbox can be attributed to the frictional force between surfaces. Based on the first law and these examples presented above, we can conclude that if a body is accelerating, then a force is acting on it. Therefore, we must assume that there is a relationship between the force acting on a body and its acceleration, which allows us to measure the force. Let us consider a ball made of wood, which is moving at the velocity v0 or at rest on a flat surface. If the ball is at rest then v0 is 0. We can push the ball, giving it a greater the velocity v1. Then we measure the distance s1 covered by the moving ball in the time interval t, which is equal to v1 times t. If the time interval t is short enough, then we obtain the average acceleration a1 of the ball by computing the ratio of the difference between v1 and the initial velocity v0 to the duration t. This average acceleration is associated with the mechanical force we applied to the ball when we pushed it. If we apply more force when we push the wooden ball, then the ball will travel with the speed v2, which is greater than v1. That can be demonstrated by measuring the distance s2 covered by the moving ball in the time interval t. The distance s2 is equal to v2 times t, and it is greater than s1. As a result, the average acceleration a2, which is equal to v2 minus v0 divided by t is also greater than the acceleration a1 obtained in the first case. Therefore, this experiment shows the following relationship between force and acceleration. The greater the force that is applied to the ball, the more the ball will accelerate. We can also associate the direction of the force acting on the ball with the direction of its acceleration. If we study the relationship between acceleration and force, then we can also determine the relationship between acceleration and inertia, and introduce the concept of mass. We have seen in the experiment with the wooden ball moving with the initial velocity v0, if we apply a given force to the ball, then it will travel the distance s1 in the time interval t. From the measured distance and time we can determine its velocity v1 given by the ratio of s1 to t, and its average acceleration a1, given v1 minus v0 divided by t. We can repeat this experiment with an iron ball of the same size as that of the wooden ball. If we apply the same force to the iron ball as in the case of the wooden ball, then the iron ball will travel a smaller distance s2 in the time interval t than the distance covered by the wooden ball. The velocity v2 of the iron ball is given by s2 divided by t and it is less than the velocity v1. As a result, the average acceleration a2, 
given by the ratio of V2 minus V0 to T is also smaller than the average acceleration A1 of the wooden ball. Then we need to apply more force so that the iron ball could move with the same acceleration as the wooden ball. By virtue of the first law, we can say that the iron ball has greater inertia than the wooden ball does with the same size, as it resists more against the attempt to change its velocity than the wooden ball did. On one hand, this result of the experiments indicates that the greater the force is acting on a body, the greater the acceleration the moving body has. On the other hand, there must be a physical quantity expressing the measure of the inertia of the bodies, which determines the relationship between the force exerted on a body and its acceleration. We call this physical quantity the mass or the inertial mass of bodies. In the example shown above, inertia and mass are associated both with the wooden ball and the iron ball. We can interpret the result of this experiment as the demonstration of the difference of the masses of the two balls. The mass of the iron ball is greater than the one of the wooden ball. In this case we say that the iron ball is heavier than the wooden ball. In these experiments we compare the amount of the force applied to the balls when pushing them. For this comparison we need to determine the amount of force. However, instead of using our sensory perception of the force exerted by our muscle, we can apply a more accurate method to measure force. In the following experiment, we use simple harmonic motion to find the exact relationship between acceleration and force. If we can measure the acceleration of a body performing oscillating motion, then we can determine the exact amount of force acting on the oscillating body. In this experimental setup we suspend an iron cylinder to compensate its gravitational acceleration, and attach two springs to the body. Both the spring are fixed at their other end, as seen in the figure. If we orient the x-axis so that it is along the axes of the springs with the origin in the middle of the cylinder, then the cylinder is at rest at origin, and it can move to any position along the x-axis in both directions. If we move the cylinder to the position x0 and release it, then the body starts a harmonic oscillation with the maximum amplitude x0 in the period t due to the forces exerted by the springs. The angular frequency omega of the cylinder is equal to 2 pi divided by the period t. We already know the equations of motion of simple harmonic motion. The displacement x of the oscillating body is given by x0 times the sine of omega times t. Its derivative with respect to the time t is the velocity of the body, which is equal to x0 times omega times the cosine of omega times t. The time derivative of the velocity gives the acceleration of the body, which is given by minus x0 times omega squared the sine of omega times t. If the maximum amplitude x0 is given, and we measure the period t of the motion, then we can determine the acceleration of the iron cylinder at any given time t. We only want to determine the maximum acceleration at the turning point x0 of the motion, that is, when the time t is equal to the one quarter of the period t. Since we can substitute the expression of the angular velocity omega into the equation of acceleration, we obtain 4 pi squared times x0 divided by the square of the period, times the sine of 2 pi squared times t divided by the period. Here it is enough to use the absolute value of the acceleration. Then the magnitude a0 of the acceleration of the cylinder at the turning point x0 is equal to 4 pi squared times x0 divided by the square of the period t. As we have already said, in order to determine the acceleration of that point, we only need to fix the maximum amplitude x0 and measure the period t or its square. Now we perform three experiments. We choose the maximum amplitude x0 of the cylinder to be 1 cm, 2 cm and 3 cm respectively, and measure the corresponding period of its oscillation. We find that the period is the same in each case. That is t squared has the same value for each maximum amplitude x0. We can conclude that the acceleration is 2 times and 3 times greater in the second and the third cases than the one measured in the first experiment. Then we have demonstrated that the acceleration of the iron cylinder at the turning points is proportional to the maximum amplitude x0 of its oscillation. We know that the greater maximum amplitude we choose for the oscillation, the more we stretch or compress the springs. But we can also assume that the more we stretch or compress the springs, the more elastic force they exert on the cylinder. Based on these observations, we interpret the result of the experiment as follows. If we want to determine the forces accelerating the cylinder, we can make the simplest possible assumption on the relation between the force and the acceleration produced by the force. Let us say that the force F0 acts on the oscillating cylinder at the maximum amplitude of 1 cm with the acceleration A0. Then the force of 2 times F0 will act on the body, when it has the acceleration of 2 times A0 at the maximum amplitude of 2 cm. 
Similarly, the acceleration of 3 times A0 at the maximum amplitude of 3 cm is produced by the force of 3 times F0 acting on the body. Therefore, we assume that the force acting on the iron cylinder is proportional to the acceleration of the body. As a result, the force acting on the body at the maximum amplitude x0 of the oscillation is proportional to that maximum amplitude in this experiment setup. Now we replace the iron cylinder with a lead cylinder which has the same size, and measure the period t of oscillating body with the maximum amplitude of 1 cm. In this case, the force acting on the lead cylinder is still equal to f0, but we find that the square of the period t is 1.5 greater than the one measured for the iron cylinder. Then the acceleration of the lead cylinder at the maximum amplitude of its oscillation is equal to A0 divided by 1.5, or it is two-thirds times the acceleration measured for the iron cylinder. We use the iron cylinder again, but we attach another iron cylinder with the same size to it, and perform the same experiment with the maximum amplitude of 1 cm. Then the force acting on the cylinders is still equal to F0, but the square of the period T is two times greater than the one measured for one cylinder. As a result, the acceleration of the double iron cylinder is the half of the acceleration measured for the single one. We have seen that the same amount of force acts on the bodies in these experiments, since the elastic forces in the stretched and the compressed springs at the same maximum amplitude are the same. The experiments show that the same force can produce such accelerations of the lead and the double iron cylinders, which are two-third and the half of the acceleration measured in the original setup. This fact can simply be attributed that, the masses of the lead and the double iron cylinders are one and a half times and two times bigger than the mass of the original iron cylinder. Then we can conclude that, the acceleration of a body is inversely proportional to its mass for a given force acting on it. In these experiments, we determine the relationships between the force acting on a body, the mass of the body and the acceleration of its motion. Based on these findings, we can state Newton's second law in the following form. The acceleration of a body is proportional to the force acting on the body, inversely proportional to the mass of the body, and it takes place in the direction along which is the force acts. Here we can see a point-like body or a point mass with the mass m. The horizontal red arrow represents the force f acting on the point mass, which produces the acceleration a of the moving body represented by the horizontal green arrow. Both the force f exerted on the body and the acceleration a of the body point in the same direction. By virtue of the second law of motion, if we apply two times greater force to the same point mass, then its acceleration is two times greater than it was in the original case. The second law also claims that, if the same amount of force is applied to a point-like body with a mass of two times m, then the acceleration of the more massive body is the half of the original one. These example demonstrates that the force is proportional to the product of the mass and the acceleration of the body. That is, the force F acting on a body is equal to some proportionality factor C, times the mass M of the body, times its acceleration A. We can also say that the acceleration of a body is equal to 1 over C times the force F acting on the body, divided by the mass M of the body. The value of the proportionality factor depends on the choice of the unit of mass and force appearing in this equation. Since we have not fixed these units yet, we will choose such units which give that the proportionality factor C is equal to 1. Then, Newton's second law states, that the force acting on a point mass is equal to the product of the mass and the acceleration of the point mass, that is the force F is equal to the mass M times the acceleration A. We call this equation the fundamental equation of dynamics. We have seen that force introduced in the second law of motion has both magnitude and direction. Therefore, we represented forces with vectors, where the length of the vector gives the amount of the force acting on a body, and its direction points to the direction of the acceleration of the body produced by the force. However, the fact that force has magnitude and direction, does not necessarily determine whether force is a vector or not. This question can only be answered by examining the superposition of more forces. We will see later that the force acting on a body is equal to the vector sum or the net force of all the forces acting on it. Based on this observation, we can say that force is a vector. This uncertainty might be surprising at first sight since we would immediately conclude that force is a vector, based on the second law of motion. The law states that the force F acting on a body is equal to the mass M of the body times its acceleration A. In the right-hand side of this formula, the acceleration derived from the position vector is a vector. The mass M of the body is a scalar, and we expect if we multiply a vector with a scalar then we obtain another vector. Then we would say that the quantity F in the left-hand side is a vector, and the whole equation is a vector equation. However, 
it does not necessarily follow from this equation that force is a vector, since force is not the product of mass and acceleration, but such an effect of bodies which is measured by this product. The superposition of several different effects can only be examined in experiments, and only the results of these experiments can confirm that the vector sum of forces gives the correct description of such a superposition. In fact, this should not be surprising, since we have already seen that the nature of different kind of forces is rather heterogeneous. The only common feature in mechanical, gravitational, elastic and frictional forces is that each of them is a manifestation of some effect on bodies. And it is far from being obvious, how these together produce a net effect on bodies. Since the kinematic quantities, like the velocity and the acceleration of a body are derived from its position vector, they are vectors by definition. This is not the case for force. The second law of motion alone cannot guarantee that force is a vector. Rather, empirical evidence is required for the confirmation of this assumption. Newton's second law of motion allowed us to introduce the concept of mass or inertial mass, which is a fundamental property of bodies in nature. There are many different methods to measure the mass of bodies, and we will first discuss the dynamic measurement of mass. Let us consider two bodies with masses M1 and M2. For example, an iron cylinder with the mass of M1, and a lead cylinder with the mass of M2, where we will approximate the cylinders with point masses in motion. The second law of motion tells us if a force F is applied to both the point masses, then the same force produces the accelerations A1 and A2 on the bodies. Since the force acting on the point masses is the same, the accelerations A1 and A2 point in the same direction and only their magnitudes are different. Therefore, the magnitude of the force F is equal to the mass M1 times the magnitude of the acceleration A1, which is also equal to the product of the mass M2 and the magnitude of the acceleration A2. It follows from this equation that the ratio of the masses is inversely proportional to the ratio of the accelerations, that is the ratio of M2 to M1 is equal to the ratio of A1 to A2. As a result, we can determine the relationship between the masses of two bodies by measuring the ratio of their accelerations produced by a given force. That can be done in the experiment with the suspended cylinders which are attached to two springs, provided the mass of the springs is negligible to those of the bodies. In this experiment setup, the acceleration of the cylinders at the maximum amplitude is inversely proportional to the square of the period of their harmonic oscillation. Then we only need to measure the period T of the harmonic oscillations of the two bodies with the same maximum amplitude x0, for example with 1 cm. We have already seen that the springs exert the same force F0 on the cylinders at the maximum amplitude X0 of their oscillation. We have also found that the square of the period T for the lead cylinder is one and a half greater than the one measured for the iron cylinder. That is, the acceleration of the lead cylinder at the maximum amplitude is equal to the acceleration A0 of the iron cylinder divided by one and a half. The ratio of the mass M2 to the mass M1 is equal to the acceleration A1 to the acceleration A2, and the right-hand side can be written as the ratio of T2 squared to T1 squared. Here T1 and T2 are the periods of the oscillations performed by the cylinders with the mass M1 and M2, respectively. Since T2 squared is equal to 1.5 times T1 squared, the ratio of the masses is equal to 1.5. That is, the lead cylinder is one and a half time more massive than the iron cylinder. Therefore, this experiment provides a relatively precise method to measure mass ratios. By measuring the ratio of the periods for the oscillations of bodies with different masses, we could determine the ratio of their masses. Here we have determined the ratio of masses of different bodies by measuring the periods of their oscillations produced by the same elastic force of the springs. We can repeat this measurement with other maximum amplitudes of oscillation of the cylinders, for example with 2 or 3 centimeters. Then the elastic force acting on the bodies at the maximum amplitude is 2 and 3 times F0, that is two or three times greater than the force accelerating the bodies at the maximum amplitude of one centimeter. We find that the periods of the oscillations remain the same, that is the square of the period for the oscillating lead cylinder is 1.5 times greater than the square of the one measured for the iron cylinder. The acceleration at the maximum amplitude of one centimeter is 1.5 times less than the one measured for the iron cylinder. For the maximum amplitudes of two and three centimeters the accelerations are two times A0 divided by 1.5, and 3 times A0 divided by 1.5 respectively. These results can be substituted in the second law for the cylinders performing simple harmonic motion, which gives the following expressions. 2 times F0 is equal to the mass M1 times 2 times A0, which is equal to the mass M2 times the ratio of 2 times A0 to 1.5. 
and 3 times F0 is equal to the mass M1 times 3 times A0, which is equal to the mass M2 times the ratio of 3 times A0 to 1.5. Then we have demonstrated that the ratio of the masses remains the same, if we apply different amount forces by modifying the maximum amplitudes or even using springs with different elastic properties. This result proves that the ratio of the masses is only the property of the two bodies, and not related with the experiment setup. Now we can attach the iron cylinder to the lead cylinder, and measure the period of the simple harmonic motion performed by the compound of the cylinders. For the maximum amplitude of 1 cm, the force applied on the double cylinder is still equal to F0. By performing the measurement, we find that the square of the period of the oscillation is 2.5 times greater than the square of the one measured in the case of the single iron cylinder. That is the ratio between the accelerations of the double cylinder and the single one is equal to 2.5. We have already seen that the ratio of the mass of the lead cylinder to the mass of the iron one is equal to 1.5, that is the lead cylinder is one and half more massive than the iron cylinder. This experiment shows that the mass ratio of the double cylinder to the single iron cylinder is 2.5, at least with a relative error of a few percent. That is the compound of cylinders is two and a half times more massive than the iron cylinder. Then we conclude that the mass of the compound of cylinders is the sum of the masses of the individual cylinders. In generally we can also demonstrate that the mass of the compound bodies is equal to the sum of the masses of their components, that is the mass is an additive or a scalar quantity. We have seen that the dynamic measurement of the mass is applied to measure the ratios between the masses of different bodies, which allows us to define the unit of mass in physics. With the dynamic method, we can measure mass ratios for any series of arbitrary bodies with masses m1, m2, m3 and so forth. If we choose the mass m1 as a unit to measure mass, then the masses m2, m3 and so forth can be determined in unit of m1. In this example we chose the cube with the mass m1 as the unit in the mass measurement, and it has a unit mass now. Then we measure the ratio of the mass m2 of the cylinder to the unit mass m1, which is equal to 4. That is the mass of the cylinder is equal to 4 measured in unit of m1. Similarly, we can measure the ratio of the mass m3 of the sphere to the unit mass m1, which is equal to 3. Then the mass of the sphere is equal to 3 measured in unit of m1. This procedure can be repeated for any member in the series of the bodies. Based on this principle, we can introduce the unit of mass in physics. The SI unit of mass is the kilogram, which is 1000 grams. The abbreviation of gram is G, and the unit symbol of kilogram is kg. The original definition of the kilogram is the mass of 1 liter or about 1 cubic decimeter of distilled water, at a temperature of 4 degrees Celsius. The modern definition of the SI unit of mass is the standard kilogram, which was in use until 2011. The standard kilogram is defined as the mass of a solid cylinder with a height equal to its diameter. The cylinder was made of 90% platinum and 10% iridium alloy, and one of its replica can be seen in the photo. Since the solid cylinder used to define the kilogram had lost a mass of about 50 microgram during 100 years, the kilogram was redefined by using the Planck constant, which has the unit of kilogram times meter squared per second squared. In order to determine the mass equivalent to 1 kilogram the so-called Kibble balance was applied, which is a device measuring mass with a high precision. The Kibble balance in the photo is based on equalizing the force produced by a test mass with another force produced, when an electrical current is run through a coil of wire immersed in a surrounding magnetic field. Here the electric current is measured using two constants, both defined in the terms of Planck's constant and the charge of the electron. The kilogram determined with this apparatus is also called as electric kilogram. After having introduced the unit of mass in physics, we give a brief overview on the basic properties of mass. As already mentioned, the mass is one of the most important fundamental properties of the bodies or the matter. If we take a simple body in our everyday environment, for example a ball, and measure its mass at a given instance of time, let us say at T1, and we measure it at another instance of time, let us say T2, then we will find that the masses measured at different instances of time are the same. That is, the mass of a body does not depend on time. If we perform the mass measurement of the ball in a given position, which is described by the position vector R1 with respect to a reference point, and we repeat the measurement in another position described by the position vector R2, then we will find that the masses measured in different positions in space are the same. That is, the mass of a body does not depend on space. If we measure the mass of the ball moving with a velocity V1, and we repeat the mass measurement when the ball travels with the velocity v2, then we will find that the masses measured in the two different states of motion are the same. 
that is the mass of a body does not depend on its velocity or its state of motion. Lastly, if we measure the mass of the ball which the force F1 acts on, and we repeat the mass measurement when the force F2 acts on the ball, then we find that masses measured under the actions of different forces are the same. That is the mass of a body does not depend on any force acting on the body. We can summarize these findings as follows. The mass of a body is constant, independent of time, space, the motion of the body, and the forces acting on the body in macroscopic scale and not for very large velocity. These properties of mass seem to be evident. However, the restriction that these statements are valid only on macroscopic scale and not for very large velocity, indicates the opposite. In classical mechanics we still accept the validity of these statements, and use them as a satisfying description of the properties of mass. We can also state that the masses of two bodies are equal, if the same force produces the same acceleration for the two bodies. That is the second law of motion tells us that the force F acting on a body is equal to the mass M of the body, times its acceleration A. By virtue of the second law, if the force F acts on the bodies with the mass M1 and M2, then produces the accelerations A1 and A2. If the accelerations A and A2 are the same, then the mass M1 is equal to the mass M2, that is the bodies have the same mass. We can also demonstrate that bodies made of different materials, with different sizes, shapes, temperatures or colors, or bodies in different states of matter can have the same masses. At the same time, bodies made of the same material can still have different masses. The last property of mass we discuss here is extremely important, not only in mechanics but also in all the branches of physics. This property is the conservation of mass. The law of conservation of mass was proven experimentally by Lomonosov in 1756 and by Lavoisier in 1773, and it states the following. The total mass of the bodies in a system remains the same even if chemical reactions or phase transitions take place in the system. This principle claims that the conservation of mass holds in any situation. The first situation or case is the mechanical transformation of a system, where the mass of a body or collection of bodies never changes, no matter how the constituent parts rearrange themselves. Here we can see a system indicated with a box within three different bodies of the masses M1, M2 and M3. In the left-hand side, the system is shown in a given configuration, where the bodies in motion are at given positions. In the right-hand side, the bodies already occupy different positions, and they might also have a different state of motion after their rearrangement. The conservation law states that even if the system has a completely different mechanical state, the total mass of the system, that is the sum of the masses M1, M2 and M3 of the bodies is constant, and it remains the same. The second case is related with chemical reactions, which were studied by Lomonosov and Lavoisier in their experiments. They proved that mass is neither created nor destroyed by chemical reactions or physical transformations. In other words, in a chemical reaction, the mass of the products will always be equal to the mass of the reactants. In any of the four basic types of chemical reactions seen in the figure, such as a synthesis or combination, a chemical decomposition, a single replacement, and a double replacement, the total sum of the mass of individual reactants is equal to the total sum of the mass of the products. The third case where the conservation of mass hold is phase transitions, where the total mass of the matter transforming from one state to another one is constant. Solid materials can melt into a liquid or liquids can freeze and solidify. Liquids can evaporate and become gas, or gases can condense to a liquid. In deposition, gas transforms into a solid, and in sublimation solids convert to gases. Whichever phase transition happens in a system, and whichever phases exist together, the total sum of the masses of the gas phase, the fluid phase and the solid phase is constant. Therefore, we conclude that matter can change forms but its mass is always conserved. As a result, different measurements of the mass of a body taken under various circumstances is always the same, that is the mass of a body or of a collection of bodies in a system is independent of the state of motion. However, this statement holds only for moving bodies with velocities that are small compared to the speed of light. After having introduced the SI unit of mass, we can also determine the SI unit of force. In kinematics, length and time are fundamental quantities, and their SI units are meter and second, respectively. The unit of any derived quantity, such as velocity and acceleration is also derived from the units of the fundamental quantities. We saw that the unit of velocity is given by length divided by time, that is its SI unit is meter per second, and the unit of acceleration is equal to length divided by time squared, which is meter per second squared in SI units. In dynamics, mass is introduced as another fundamental quantity and its SI unit is kilogram. 
In mechanics, these three fundamental quantities, that is length, time and mass are sufficient to derive all the other physical quantities. As an initiative by Gauss and Weber, the system of physical units was introduced 1836, where length, time and mass together with their units were considered to be the fundamental quantities and units. We have already denoted length, time and mass with L, T and M, respectively, and their units were written as these letters in square brackets. Then the units of all derived physical quantities can be derived from the fundamental units, based on the laws and definitions in physics. The unit of any derived quantity Q has the form L raised to the power alpha, times M raised to the power beta, times T raised to the power gamma, where alpha, beta and gamma are integer numbers in mechanics. If we specify the fundamental units in SI, then we can write it as meter raised to the power alpha, times kilogram raised to the power beta, times second raised to the power gamma. Based on this system of units, we can derive the unit of force now. Force is introduced in Newton's second law of motion, which tells us that the force F acting on a body is equal to the mass M of the body times its acceleration A. Then the unit of force is equal to the unit of mass times the unit of acceleration. This expression can be written as the unit of mass, times the unit of length, times the unit of time raised to the power of minus 2. Now we can give the unit of force in SI, which is kilogram times meter per second squared. The SI unit of force is also known as Newton, that is 1 Newton is equal to 1 kilogram times meter per second squared. In other words, 1 Newton is the force required to accelerate 1 kilogram of mass at the rate of 1 meter per second squared in the direction of the applied force. For example, we can easily determine the magnitude of the gravitational force acting on any object. If a mass of 1 kilogram rests on a table, the downward force on the table is equal to 9.81 newtons. We have already studied free fall and projectile motion in kinematics, and we continue the study of these phenomena in dynamics by introducing the concept of weight. In kinematics we have the following findings. A body that falls or a projectile that travels through a vacuum has a gravitational acceleration, denoted by g. The average value of this acceleration is 9.81 meter per second squared at sea level and is directed downward. Since free-falling bodies or projectiles has acceleration, we conclude from Newton's second law that a force is exerted on a body in free fall or on a projectile by the Earth, which is called gravitational force. If the mass of the free-falling body or the projectile is m, then the magnitude of the gravitational force is equal to the mass m times the gravitational acceleration g, and is directed downward. This gravitational force acting on the body is called the weight of the body, and denoted by the capital letter g. That is the weight g of a body is the force exerted on it by the gravity of Earth, and it is given by the mass m times the gravitational acceleration g. Experience taught us that the gravitational acceleration is the same for every object at a given location on the Earth's surface, but it depends on the location. That is, the constant, downward-pointing vectors of the gravitational acceleration at every point near the Earth's surface are only used as an approximation. Therefore, the weight of a body measured at a given location is proportional to its mass but changes with the location, as opposed to its mass, which is an inherent property of the bodies and does not depend on space. For example, the weight of a body with the mass of 1 kg at sea level is equal to 9.81 kg m per second squared at the latitude of 45 degrees, whereas it is equal to 9.78 kg m per second at the equator, and 9.83 kg m per second at the poles of the Earth. Unlike mass, the weight is not exclusively a property of the bodies. But rather, it is a force depending on the location on the Earth. The concept of weight allows us to measure force. The measurement of force based on balancing the weight of the bodies is called static measurement. One of the possible methods for static measurement of force is the following. If a body of a mass m is suspended from a spring, then the spring stretches a certain distance and the body stays at rest. The second law of motion tells us if the body is at rest, that is its acceleration is zero, then the force acting on the body must vanish. However, there are two forces acting on the body now. The first one is the gravitational force pulling the body downward, even if the body is at rest. This force is represented by the weight g of the body, which is equal to the mass m of the body times the gravitational acceleration g. The second force acting on the body is the elastic force due to the stretch of the spring, and the amplitude of the force Fs exerted by the spring is equal to the weight g, but this force acts in the opposite direction. That is Fs is equal to minus g. The downward pull on the body due to the gravitational force is compensated by the elastic force pulling the body upward. 
the net force acting on the body is the vector sum of these forces, which vanishes since the two forces have the same magnitude but the opposite direction. Therefore the net force F is equal to the weight G of the body plus the force Fs exerted on the body by the spring, which gives zero. Since the net force vanishes, the forces acting on the body are in balance, and the body remains at rest. We can study this balance by applying a series of bodies with the masses M1, M2 and so forth, which have the weights M1 times G, M2 times G and so forth. If the suspend these bodies from the string, then we see that the greater the weight of the body is, the greater the distance the string stretches. Here the distances of the stretch are denoted with D1, V2 and so forth. If the distance the spring stretches remains small, then the distance is proportional to the force stretching the spring, that is D1 is proportional to M1 times G, D2 is proportional to M2 times G, and so forth. The proportionality between the distance the spring stretches and the weight of the load suspended from the string can be used to measure the amount of force exerted on the spring by a load at rest, which is the operating principle of spring dynamometers. Since the measurement happens in the balance of forces, that is when the load suspended from the spring is at rest, we call this method the static measurement of force. Spring dynamometers are also called spring balance. Here we can see such a device, which consists of a metal spring on a two-part mounting. One end of the spring is fixed, and the other one has a hook or an eye for the suspension of the load exerting the force we are trying to measure. We can read the amount of force off a scale calibrated in units of force, that is in the units of mass times acceleration. We also show another dynamometer with a scale on a dial. Dial dynamometers normally use a sturdy metal spring, and their measuring range can be several order of magnitude greater than the one of the simple spring balance. Force can also be measured by comparing its magnitude with a known weight, for example by applying a single fixed pulley with a rope passing over it. If a body with the mass M is suspended from one end of the rope, we can hold the other end in our hand. The muscular force F can be applied to keep the suspended body at rest. Then the applied force must be equal to the weight of the body, which is given by the mass M times the gravitational acceleration G. The direction of the applied force does not need to be opposite to the one of the gravitational force. It can have an arbitrary direction, since the pulley can convert the direction of the gravitational force without changing its magnitude. Now we summarize the basic elements of the principle used by the static measurement of force, which helps us to compare the static and the dynamic methods. In the static measurement of force, a force of unknown magnitude is compensated with another force, which has a known amplitude, for example the elastic force of a given spring or a weight of a given body. In the examples we had a ball with the weight g, which is equal to the mass m of the ball times the gravitational acceleration g. If the mass of the ball is unknown or the precise value of the gravitational acceleration is not determined at the location of the measurement, then the magnitude of the force exerted by the ball, that is its weight is unknown. If we suspend the ball from a spring or a rope passing over a pulley, where the another body with a given mass is attached to the other end of the rope, then the elastic force of a spring or the weight of a body has a known magnitude. This known force can be used to compensate the unknown force G. The system in which examine the force balance consists of the apparatus providing the compensation force together with the ball exerting the unknown force. The principle of the method is that the elastic force of the spring or the weight of the body used to compensate the force is known. If the unknown force exerted by the ball is compensated, then the forces in the system are balanced and the system is at rest. Now we can compare the static measurement of force with the dynamic method. In the static measurement of force, we can apply a relatively simple apparatus, which allows us to use some convenient method for the measurement. In the dynamic measurement of force, we need a more complicated apparatus, which makes the measurement method less convenient. The method applied in the static measurement of force is based on the effect of some static force producing deformation of bodies, which the force acts on. In the dynamic measurement of force, the method is based on the effect of some dynamic force accelerating bodies which the force acts on. We saw that springs are stretched by a weight attached to them. In fact, forces acting on any macroscopic object cause deformations, which are discernible in the case of springs and other elastic bodies, but less discernible in the case of non-elastic ones. For example, books placed on a table have a weight G, and exert this force on the surface of the table. As a result, the surface deformation of the table causes a deformation force FD compensating the weight G of the books. Since these force are balanced, the books remain at rest. The fact that the weight of a body is proportional to its mass, allows us to perform a simple but accurate measurement of mass. We place two bodies with the mass M1 and M2 on two pans suspended from a fixed pulley. 
this system only remains at rest if the bodies have the same weight and the forces in the system are balanced. We suppose that the gravitational acceleration g is also the same everywhere in the system with a relatively small size, and we can write for the weight balance of the bodies that the mass m1 times the gravitational acceleration g is equal to the mass m2 times g. Since g is the same at the locations of the two bodies, it is constant in this equation. Therefore, the mass m1 is equal to the mass m2. If the mass m1 is unknown and the mass m2 is known, then the body of the mass m2 can be used to determine the mass m1. Since the static measurement of mass is based on the force balance, or the balance of weight, the instruments used for such measurements are known as balance or balance scale. Here we can see two balance scales, a traditional one in the left-hand side, and a Roberval balance in the right-hand side. If we have a set of bodies with different mass, we can use any combination of them to produce a proper weight compensating the unknown one. The set of bodies used in mass or weight measurement is called a series of weights. Since the gravitational acceleration g is cancelled out in both sides of the equation describing the balance of weight, the local variation of the gravitational acceleration does not have any effect on the static mass measurement. Therefore, such measurements can be carried out with a high accuracy by applying sensitive lab instruments called analytical balances. If we know the exact mass of a given body, then its weight is given by the product of its mass and the precise value of the gravitational acceleration at the location of the measurement. By considering the working principle of the static measurement of mass, we will realize that we need to introduce a new concept for mass, called gravitational mass. Let us see how to proceed with it. We have already seen that Newton's second law of motion defines the mass of bodies measuring their inertia, that is their resistance against any effect which attempts to change their state of motion. This type of mass is known as inertial mass. Since the second law states that the inertial mass m of a body times its acceleration a is equal to the force f acting on the body, we can rewrite it as mi times a equal to f, where mi denotes the inertial mass of the body accelerated by the force f. However, we have also seen that in the static measurement of mass the bodies are at rest, when their masses are compared with each other. Since the state of the motion of the bodies does not change during the measurement, that is they remain at rest, the inertial mass of the bodies does not play any role in the static measurement of mass. As a result, the mass of a body determined in the static measurement does not describe its inertia but another property, which we call the gravitational mass of the body. Therefore, in the equation defining the weight g of the body as the product of its mass m and the gravitational acceleration g, the mass is the gravitational mass of the body, and we denote it by mg. Here we do not interpret the gravitational acceleration g as the acceleration of bodies in free fall but as a proportionality constant between the weight and the gravitational mass of the body, which depends on the location of the body. We can also demonstrate the meaning of gravitational mass in the following way. If we measure the weights of two different bodies, for example a ball and a cube, with a spring balance at different locations on the Earth's surface, then we find that the spring stretches by different amounts in different locations, that is the weights g1 and g2 of the bodies depend on the location of the measurement. However, the ratio of their weights, that is the ratio of the weight g1 to the weight g2 is independent of the location. Based on these results, we assume that the weight g of an arbitrary body can be written as a product of two factors, let us say mg and gl, where mg describes an inherent property of the body, and we call it gravitational mass of the body, and gl is a proportionality factor which solely depends on the location on the Earth's surface. Then we see that the ratio of g1 to g2 is equal to the ratio of m1 to m2, which is a constant related to the properties of the two bodies and independent to the location of the measurement. Here the factors mg and gl have nothing to do with the inertial mass and the gravitational acceleration, even their units can be arbitrary. However, we can still establish the equivalence of gravitational and inertial mass. From the second law of motion we see that any force f acting on the body is equal to the inertial mass mi of the body, times its acceleration a. Let us consider the case when only the gravitational force g acts on the body with the inertial mass mi, which is equal to the product of the factors mg and gl. If we choose the units of the factors mg and gl so that their product gives the unit of force, then we can write that the force f accelerating the body is equal to the weight g of the body. As a result, the inertial mass mi of the body times its acceleration a is equal to its gravitational mass mg times the factor gl. That is, the ratio of the gravitational mass mg of a body to its the inertial mass mi is equal to the ratio of its acceleration a to the factor gl. If the body falls freely, then its acceleration a is equal to the gravitational acceleration g, which can be determined experimentally. 
therefore, the ratio of mg to mi can be written as the ratio of g to gl. If any object in free fall has the exactly same acceleration g at a given location on the Earth's surface, then the ratio of g to gl is the same for any object at that location. As a result, the ratio of mg to mi is also the same, that is the gravitational mass of a body is proportional to its inertial mass. When we chose the units of the factors mg and gl so that their products should provide the unit of force, we had not specified their units uniquely yet. If we chose the unit of the factor gl such that gl is equal to the gravitational acceleration g, then the gravitational mass mg of a body is equal to its inertial mass mi. Then we can conclude that, the gravitational mass and the inertial mass of a body are equal. This statement is the equivalence principle, which is not self-evident but follows from the remarkable fact, that the acceleration g is the same for all objects in free fall. However, the universality of free fall cannot be demonstrated in experiments with free falling bodies or pendulums with the required accuracy. The Utvush experiment was the first high accuracy test of the equivalence of gravitational and inertial mass. This photo shows the torsion balance used in the experiment, which could establish the proportionality between the two types of mass with a relative error of 10 to minus 9. Over the last hundred years several tests have been performed to confirm the equivalence principle, and one of the latest measurements is the microscope project. This was a satellite test, where two sets of bodies of different composition were subjected to the same acceleration. In the experiment it was verified that the equivalence principle is correct within the precision of 10 to minus 17. Based on these results, we can regard the two types of mass the same quantity, and state that the mass of a body describes both its inertial and its gravitational aspect. That is, if the mass of two bodies are equal, then their inertia and their weight measured at a given location are the same. Now we will present some basic examples demonstrating the idea of Newton's third law of motion. In the second law of motion, the concept of the force acting on point-like bodies was introduced to describe the effect of other bodies on the given body. That is, by definition, only other bodies are able to exert a force on a given body in mechanics. For example, if we consider the rolling ball A, which changes the direction of its motion after the collision with the ball B, then we can state that the ball B has an effect on the ball A at the instance of their collision. By applying the point mass model, we can say that a force is exerted on the point mass A by the point mass B, which changed its state of motion. Then the question arises what happens to the ball B, when it exerts the force F on the ball A. We can find the answer if we examine some simple examples. In the original example with the colliding balls, we can see that ball B also changes its state of motion due to the collision. Either it changes the direction of its motion if it was already in motion, or it starts to move if it was at rest. But we can also examine a static situation. If we grasp a heavy table and pull it, then we feel the pull of the table with our hand. If we push it, then the table pushes against our hand. That is, we apply a force on the table, and at the same time we also feel the force exerted by the table. In this example the body A represents the table, and the body B represents our body. Similarly, if we give a shot with a gun then we feel its push back with our shoulder by the recoil. That is the gun exerts a force on the bullet as it is launching it forward. At the same time the bullet also exerts a force on the gun and our shoulder, pushing them backward. In this example the body A represents the bullet, and the body B represents the gun and our shoulder. Another trivial example is disembark. If we jump out of a boat to the river bank, then the boat moves away from the bank. That is, the boat exerts a force on us in the direction of the bank when we jump out of it, and at the same time we also exert a force on it in the direction of the water. In this example the body A represents our body and the body B represents the boat. There are many more examples for this phenomenon, which demonstrate two things. First, if the body B exerts a force on the body A, then the body A also exerts a force on the body B in the opposite direction. Second, the greater the force that is applied on the body A by the body B, the greater the force that is produced by the body A. Now we consider an experiment which allows us to have some qualitative analysis of this phenomenon. Let us suppose that the persons A and B are standing on two seg scooters, with the opposite ends of a rope in their hands. We will study three different cases with this experiment set up. In the first case, the person A pulls the rope, whereas the person B just holds it. In the second case we exchange the roles of the persons, the person B pulls the rope, while the person A only holds it. In the third case, both the persons pull the rope. If we perform this experiment, then it turns out that all the three cases have the same result. 
both the scooters will move closer to each other, and if the masses of the persons plus the scooters are the same on the both sides, then they meet in the middle. This result indicates that the force produced by A and exerted on B, and the force produced by B and exerted on A have the same magnitude and in the opposite direction. Because of the friction of the wheels, the earth has some insignificant effect on the horizontal motion of the scooters. However, the experiment has a symmetric setup, and the amount of any frictional force produced on both sides during the motion is the same. As a result, we can assume that the conclusions drawn from this experiment are reliable. We also need to note that these results do not depend on the nature of the forces applied on the bodies, which is demonstrated in the following experiment. If we insert small magnet and iron bars with the same mass in two corks, and let them float on the water, we can study the effect they have on each other. If the corks are close enough so that the magnet has an effect on the iron bar, then they approach each other and travel the same distance until they meet. This result shows that the magnet bar attracts the iron bar just as much as the iron bar attracts the magnet bar in the corks. In other words, the force exerted on the iron bar by the magnet and the force exerted on the magnet by the iron bar have the same magnitude and in the opposite direction. In general, we can say that all experiments using forces of different nature have the same results related to the mutual action of two or more bodies. That is, mechanical forces, gravitational forces, elastic forces, magnetic forces and so on can produce the same phenomena in nature and we can generalize the conclusions drawn from the result of the experiments presented here. This generalization leads us to Newton's third law of motion, which is also known as the law of action and reaction. Whenever one body exerts a force on a second body, the first body experiences a force that is equal in magnitude and opposite in direction to the force that it exerts. By applying the point mass model for the bodies A and B acting on each other, we can say the following. If a body B exerts a force FAB on body A, then A simultaneously exerts a force FBA on B, or in mathematical form, FAB is equal to minus FBA. According to this law, forces always appear in pairs, but these forces in the pair force, called action, and opposite force, called reaction, always act on different bodies. Newton's second law states that the force F acting on a body is equal to the mass of the body times its acceleration, which can be substituted in the mathematical form of the third law applied for the bodies A and B acting on each other. If MA is the mass of the point mass A, and AAB is the acceleration of the point mass A produced by the force F and B, and similarly, MB is the mass of the point mass B, and ABA is the acceleration of the point mass B produced by the force FBA, we can write that the mass MA times the acceleration AB is equal to minus the mass MB times the acceleration ABA. This equation shows that even if the magnitude of the action and reaction is the same, the ratio of the magnitudes of the accelerations is determined by the ratio of the masses of the bodies. That is, the ratio of the magnitude of the acceleration AB to the magnitude of the acceleration ABA is equal to the ratio of the mass MB to the mass MA. Let us discuss the consequences of this formula. We can return to the experiment with the persons A and B standing on seg scooters and pulling the two ends of a rope. If the total mass of the person A and the scooter he stands on is two times greater than the one of the person B and his scooter, then the acceleration of the person B is two times of the acceleration of the person A, as long as no other bodies have an effect on their motion. Another example in which the interacting bodies have enormously different masses is the free fall of a ball towards the earth. When a ball of the mass M freely falls, it has the acceleration G, and by the virtue of the third law, the ball has also an effect on the earth with the mass denoted with capital M. Then the earth moves with the acceleration A given by the ratio of M to capital M, times G in the direction of the ball with respect to the inertial frame of the fixed stars in the sky. Since the ratio of the mass of the ball to the mass of the earth is enormously small, this acceleration is essentially zero. That is, the effect of the falling ball is negligible on the earth. Indeed, everyday experience shows that falling or accelerating objects near earth's surface have a negligible effect on the earth, since their masses are negligible compared to the mass of our planet. We can also consider the static case of the interaction between the ball and the earth, when the ball is at rest on earth's surface. In this case, we have to treat the ball and the earth as elastic spheres. The gravitational force F1, considered as action, and the opposite force F2, considered as reaction, press these spheres against each other, which deforms the ball and the surface of the earth. As a result, the ball exerts a deformation force F2 prime on the surface of the earth, drawn at the center C of the earth. Because of the principle of action and reaction, the earth also exerts the force F1 prime on the ball, 
which is equal to minus F2 prime. Overall, the force F1 plus F1 prime is exerted on the ball, and the force F2 plus F2 primes acts on the earth. Since both the ball and the earth are at rest, at least with respect to each other, these forces must vanish. That is, F1 plus F1 prime is equal to zero, and F2 plus F2 prime is also equal to zero. As a result, the opposite force F1 prime of the deformation force is equal to minus the gravitational force F1, and the deformation force F2 prime is equal to minus the force F2, which is equal to the deformation force F1. We can also consider slightly more complicated examples to study the consequences of the principle of action and reaction. In the first example, a ball is at rest either on a table or a spring, where we neglect the weight of the table or the spring. Based on the previous example we know that the gravitational force F1 acts on the ball and its opposite force A the force F2. These forces press the ball and the earth together, and the ball exerts the deformation force F2 prime on the surface of the earth via the table or the spring. As a result, the earth also exerts the force F1 prime on the ball. At the same time, there are two other forces acting on the table or the spring transmitting the forces between the ball and the earth. The force F3 is the weight of the ball which is equal to the gravitational force F1, and the force F3 prime exerted by the Earth, which is equal to minus F1. These forces press the table or the spring which remains at rest. We draw the forces F2 prime and F3 prime along the axis of the spring. When the ball is at rest on the table these forces are the vector sum of the forces acting along the legs of the table. Here we can see three pairs of action and reaction. The first force pair, denoted by A, is the interaction between the ball and the table or the spring. The second pair of forces is denoted by B, and it is the interaction between the table or the spring and the earth. The third force pair denoted by C is the interaction between the ball and the earth, which is transmitted by the force pairs A and B. In the next example, we suspend the ball through a string or a spring attached to a stand, where we neglect the mass of the string or the spring and we treat the stand as the part of the earth. In this case there are two forces acting on the ball. The weight F of the ball and the force minus F exerted by the string or the spring. The forces acting on the string or the spring are the following. The opposite force F exerted by the ball at the lower end of the string or the spring, and the force minus F exerted by the stand at its upper end. The force acting on the stand is the opposite force acting at the upper end of the string or the spring, which is just the weight F of the ball. This force transmits the weight of the ball to the earth, and this weight has the opposite force minus F. In this example, we also have three force pairs. The force pair A is the interaction between the ball and the string or spring. The force pair B is the interaction between the string or spring and the stand or the earth. The force pair C is the interaction between the ball and the stand or the earth, which is transmitted by the force pairs A and B. Based on these examples, we can state that a string with a negligible mass under tension can transmit a force acting on its one end to any object connected to its other end, without modifying the force. Then, in the experiment with the persons on scooters pulling a rope, we can regard the force exerted by one of the persons on one of ends of the rope, as a force acting on the other person holding the other end of the rope. We can conclude that the forces keeping a string or a rope under tension, or expanding and contracting a spring, act on both ends of them, and the forces have the same magnitude in the opposite direction. This conclusion can be demonstrated in the following experiment, where one end of a spring balance is connected to the wall, and a body is suspended from its other end through a string passing over a fixed pulley. And in another experiment, where two bodies with the same weight are suspended from both the ends of a spring balance. In the first case, the suspended body has the weight F1, and the force F1 pulls the spring balance. The force F2 exerted by the wall pulls the other end of the spring balance. In the second case, the suspended bodies have the weights F1 and F2, and the forces F1 and F2 pull the spring balance from both ends. The spring balance measures the force F2 in both cases. We have already presented Newton's three laws of motion, which are the fundamental laws of mechanics. However, another principle was established by Leonardo and Steven, which is also of crucial importance in mechanics. In the previous examples, we studied forces which were exerted on a given body by another body or a group of bodies. A special case of them was a body suspended from a spring or was at rest on a table, where only two forces acted on the body. We saw that the static measurement of force is based on the fact that a point-like body at rest will remain at rest, if two forces with the same magnitude in the opposite direction act on it. Now we present the following experiment studying such a static case, which helps us to demonstrate Leonardo and Stebbins' principle. We suspend three bodies with the weights F1, F2 and F3, 
where the strings used for the suspension are tied at the ends with a knot in the point P. The strings attached to the bodies with the weights F1 and F2 pass over two fixed pulleys. For the given weights F1, F2 and F3, we can find an angle between the directions of the strings passing over the pulleys such that the system is at rest, that is the forces acting in the system are balanced. Since the strings can transmit the forces exerted by the suspended bodies to the knot at the point P, the forces F1, F2 and F3 act at the point P. By virtue of the first law, the body of the weight F3 can only remain at rest if the net force acting on it is zero, that is the net effect of the forces F1 and F2 at the point P is equivalent to the opposite of the force F3. Therefore, the criterion of the force balance in the system is that the force minus F3 acting in the point P can be replaced with the forces F1 and F2. The force minus F3 can be constructed by applying the parallelogram law for the vectors representing the forces F1 and F2. As a result, the effect of the force minus F3 is equivalent with the effects of the forces F1 and F2, provided the force F3 is the vector sum of them. This can be achieved by adjusting the angle between the strings in the experiment setup. Then we can conclude that two forces acting at one point can be replaced in equivalent force, which is the resultant of those forces. Since the parallelogram law allows us to add and decompose forces acting in a given point as vectors, force can be regarded as a vector. This conclusion was reached by Leonardo and Steven when they studied problems related to statics. But everyday experience shows that this principle holds under general conditions and can be applied throughout physics. Since Leonardo and Steven's principle is valid in general, it is also known as the fourth law of motion. In its general form this law states that if the forces F1, F2, ellipsis, Fn simultaneously act on a point-like body, then the net effect of these forces is equivalent to the vector sum of these forces, that is the net force F is equal to the sum of Fi, where the index I runs form 1 to N. Therefore, the fundamental equation of dynamics applied to a point-like body with the mass M is the following, the mass M of the body times its acceleration A is equal to the force F, which is the vector sum of all the forces acting on the body. The fourth law of motion can be expressed in another form, which is known as the principle of the physical independence of forces or the superposition of forces. We present this form of the fourth law with a simple example, where we study the simultaneous and the separate action of two forces on a body. If either the force F1 or F2 acts on the point-like body of the mass M, then the second law of motion states that the acceleration of the body is either A1, which is equal to F1 divided by M, or A2, which is equal to F2 divided by M. If the two forces act on the body simultaneously, then the net force exerted on the body is F1 plus F2, and the acceleration A of the body is equal to F1 plus F2 divided by M. The right-hand side of the equation can be written as F1 divided by M, plus F2 divided by M, which is equal to A1 plus A2. In fact, this expression is not the sum of the individual equations for the accelerations A1 and A2, but the consequence of the fourth law. The addition of the two vector equations is based on the assumption that the force F1 produces the acceleration A1, that is the force has still the same effect on the body, even if the force F2 acts on the body, and vice versa. The effect of the force F2 is independent on the effect of the force F1 as well. If the effect of the force F1 changed the original force F2 acting on the same body to F2 prime, then the acceleration of the body were F1 plus F2 prime divided by M, which is not equal to the original acceleration. The fourth law, as a principle established by experience, claims that the forces acting simultaneously on the point mass have no effect on each other, and the net effect of these forces on the body is the superposition of their individual effects. Therefore this law is also called the principle of physical independence of forces or the principle of the superposition of forces. The fundamental equation expressing the principle of the superposition of forces gives the answer to the basic question of statics, which is related to the criterion of the equilibrium of a mechanical system. This equation tells us that the acceleration A of a body is proportional to the net force acting on it. We examine the question in statics, where the body is at rest and there is no motion, that its acceleration vanishes. In fact, we are interested in the equilibrium of the body which can be defined as follows. A body or a group of bodies under the influence of external forces is in equilibrium, if it is at rest at a given time, and it will remain at rest. For example, a point mass performing simple harmonic motion is not in equilibrium in the turning points of the oscillation, since its velocity is not zero there. The question is under what condition a point mass at rest will remain at rest, while forces act on it. By virtue of the fundamental equation, 
The necessary condition of the equilibrium of a point-like body is that both its velocity v and acceleration a vanish, that is the net force acting on the body is zero. Since the net force is given by the vector sum of all the forces acting on the body, that sum must vanish. Conversely, if the vector sum of the forces, that is the net force acting on the body vanishes, then the acceleration of the body is zero. However, this is not a sufficient condition as to ensure the state of rest, since the vanishing acceleration of the body can allow the body to have a constant velocity, which holds for uniform rectilinear motion. For a necessary and sufficient condition, we also suppose that the point mass is at rest in a given instant of time, that is its velocity is zero at that time. If the net force acting on the body is also zero, then its vanishing acceleration already guarantees that the body will remain at rest, that is the body is in equilibrium. Then the necessary and sufficient condition of equilibrium of a point-like body is that its velocity is zero at a given time, and the forces acting on the body are balanced. In the end of this presentation on the four laws of motion let us summarize its main conclusions. We started the presentation with Newton's three laws of motion, in which he thoroughly clarified the role of forces and mass in dynamics. In his first law of motion he tells us that the state of motion of bodies can only be changed by an effect of other bodies, and he called this effect force. Therefore, a body has a uniform linear motion or stays at rest if forces do not act on it. The first law also defines a special frame of reference, called inertial frame of reference in which the first law holds. In an accelerating frame, objects do not necessarily have a uniform linear motion, even if they are not subject to forces. The second law of motion determines the quantitative relation between the effect, that is the force acting on a body and the rate of the change in the state of motion of the body, that is its acceleration due to the force. The law states that the force acting on the body is directly proportional to the acceleration, and the proportionality constant is the mass of the body. As a consequence of the laws of motion, mass was introduced as a fundamental property of bodies in dynamics. The mass of a body is constant, independent of time, space, the motion of the body, and the forces acting on the body in macroscopic scale and not for very large velocity. The masses of two bodies are equal if the same force produces the same acceleration for the two bodies. The law of conservation of mass is a fundamental law in nature, and states that the total mass of the bodies in a system remains the same even if chemical reactions or phase transitions take place in the system. In the case of bodies at rest we can talk about the gravitational mass of bodies, which we associate with their heaviness and can determine in static measurements. The weight of bodies is related to with the gravitational mass of bodies, although they are not the same concept. The mass is an inherent property of a body, whereas the weight of a body is the gravitational force acting on the body. The latter one is proportional to both the mass of the body and the gravitational acceleration at the location of the measurement. The concept of weight helps us to explain what happens in mass and force measurements. However, bodies have also inertial mass, which can be interpreted as their resistance to the effects changing their state of motion, and determined in dynamic measurements. These two types of masses have nothing to do with each other, but the universality of free fall demonstrates the equivalence principle stating that the gravitational mass and inertial masses are equivalent. The third law of motion tells us that the effects changing the state of motion of bodies are mutual interactions, that is for every action there is an opposite and equal reaction. In other words, whenever one body exerts a force on a second body, called action, the second body exerts a force on the first one, called reaction. The reaction force is equal in magnitude and opposite to the action force. We finish the presentation with the fourth law of motion traced back to Leonardo and Steven, which states that we can replace two forces acting at a given point of a body by an equivalent force constructed by the parallelogram law. This principle is crucial for the interpretation of force as a vector, since it allows us to describe the effects of bodies on other bodies by vectors in a quantitative analysis of their interaction.